Good day students! Welcome to Teacher Sally YouTube channel. I'm Rosalie Custodio, your grade 9 science teacher. In this video, you will gain an understanding about the quantum mechanical model of the atom. This is important so you will understand that the characteristics of matter are related to how electrons are distributed inside the atoms. Are you ready? So without further ado, let's begin. In today's lesson, we should be able to explain how the quantum mechanical model of the atom describes the energies and positions of the electrons. Specifically, describe quantum mechanical model and determine the relationship between principal energy level, sublevel, orbital, and how they relate to the number of electrons of an atom. Let's recall all the things that we know about the structure of atoms has been developed over a long period of time in the past. Before we properly understood the structure of the atom, scientists came up with lots of different models or pictures to describe what atoms look like. Nowadays, we know that atoms are made up of positively charged particles in the center surrounded by negatively charged electrons. Let's review some of these atomic models. This is the solid sphere model of John Dalton. John Dalton based his atom theory on two verified scientific laws, the law of conservation of mass and the law of constant composition. The law of conservation of mass states that within a closed system, matter cannot be created or destroyed. It can change forms but is conserved. Now, according to the law of constant composition, it states that pure compounds will always have the same proportion of the same elements. Dalton's atomic theory states that, number one, everything is composed of atoms, which are the indivisible buildings, blocks of matter, and cannot be destroyed. Number two, all atoms of an element are identical. Number three, the atoms of different elements vary in size and mass. Number four, compounds are produced through different full number combination of atoms. And lastly, a chemical reaction in the rearrangement of atoms in the reactant and product compounds. This is the plant coding model of J.J. Thomson. Thomson discovered the negatively charged particles of electrons through this cathode ray experiment. He noticed a movement in a chip. He called the movement cathode rays. The rays move from the negative end of the chip to the positive end. He realized that the rays were made of negatively charged particles, electrons. Based on the result of this experiment, he came out with a new atomic model known as the quantum body model. It describes that the atom is made of sphere of positive charges with negative charged electrons embedded on it. Let's now have Ernest Rutherford. He discovered the nucleus, a dense positively charged center of the atom through the gold fourth experiment, and he called his model the nuclear atomic model. Rutherford has proved Sir J. P. Thompson's model of the atom as a uniformly distributed substance because only very few of the alpha particles in his beam were scattered by large angles after striking the gold foil. While most pass completely true, Rutherford knew that the gold atoms mass must be concentrated in a finely dense nucleus. In his experiment, most of the positively charged bullets pass right through the gold atoms in the sheet of gold foil without changing course at all. Some of the positively charged bullets, however, did bounce away from the sheet or from the gold sheet as if they had hit something solid. He knew that positive charges repel positive charges. This could only mean that the gold atoms in the sheet were mostly open space. Atoms were not a fully filled with a positively charged material. 
Other court concluded that an atom had a small, dense, positively charged center that repelled his positively charged bullets. He called the center of the atom the nucleus. The nucleus is tiny compared to the atom as a whole. In the nuclear model, the atom has a dense, positively charged nucleus surrounded by negatively charged electrons. The atom is mostly empty space and its mass is concentrated in the nucleus consisting of protons and neutrons. However, it could not explain why metals or compounds of metal give up characteristic color when heated in flame such as in fireworks. Let's find out more. Striking display of fireworks is done all over the world during New Year's Eve. Have you observed the different colors of light emitted by these fireworks? Do you know what is responsible for these array of colors? Would you believe that this is due to the arrangement of electrons within the atoms? How is light produced? This is the explanation behind fireworks. Each color of light has a specific wavelength. Among the visible light, red light has the longest wavelength and has the lowest energy. Violet light has the shortest wavelength and has the highest energy. Fireworks effects are produced by the combustion of explosive materials present in fireworks. These explosive materials are also called metal salts. Metal salts emit characteristic color of light when heated as shown in the table. In the table, it shows the color emitted of some metal salts and its element responsible for its color. So we have here in the first column the metal salt tested, second column the element producing color, and the third column the color of the flame. Chlorine is responsible for green, calcium, orange, sodium, yellow, orange, potassium, light, violet, and copper, blue, green. Moving on, an atom gets excited. It absorbs energy to move to a higher energy level in an unstable state. It excites by giving up the extra energy by emission of light to its original energy level or ground state. The energy absorbed or released varies as shown by its color. Electrons in each orbit have definite energy. This energy increases as the distance of the orbit from the nucleus increases. These orbits are also known as shells or energy levels and are assigned each a number n is equal to 1, n is equal to 2, n is equal to 3, etc. Or letters K, L, N, N, O, etc. As long as the electron stays in its given orbit, there is no absorption or emission of energy. If the electron receives extra energy, it can jump into a higher energy level. This is also called excited state. The electron in the excited state can return to its original, lower energy. Excitation of the electron by absorbing energy raises the atom from the ground state to an excited state. A quantum of energy in the form of light is emitted when the electron drops back to a lower energy level. The light emitted by an electron moving from a higher to a lower energy level has a frequency directly proportional to the energy change of the electrons. Did you know that an element can be identified by its emission spectra? When atoms absorb energy, electrons move into higher energy levels. These electrons then lose energy by emitting light when they return to lower energy levels. And this is also known as atomic spectra. When compounds of different elements are heated over a flame, it comes to a point where the hot, precious atom begins to emit light of a definite color. Analysis of light given up by the vapors of elements can be done more precisely with an instrument called spectroscope. With the use of spectroscope, one can detect a series of narrow lines or line spectrum 
on the light hidden up by an element. The spectral lines suggest different energy levels in an atom. Now, this is an example of atomic spectra. How did Neil Bohr explain the spectral lines of an element shown in the spectroscope? Each line in the atomic spectra of elements suggests definite energy transformations within the atom. Bohr stated that electrons are moving around the nucleus in circular path or orbit at definite distance from the nucleus. In summary, here's the Niels Bohr explanation of atomic spectra. The individual lines in the atomic spectra corresponds to a definite energy transformation within the atom. Electrons move around the nucleus in a thick circular orbits. Orbits are located at definite distances from the nucleus and is also known as energy level or n, where n is any whole number. These orbits also have definite or quantized energy which increases as distance from the nucleus increases. This is Niels Bohr planetary model. In this model, electrons move in circular orbits within specific energy levels around the nucleus. Electrons have a definite energy in each orbit, which increases as the distance of orbit from the nucleus increases. There is no absorption or emission of energy if the electron stays in its orbit. However, when an electron absorbs extra energy, this electron moves to a higher energy level. This is when we say that the electron becomes excited, making the atom unstable. If an excited electron jumps down a level, it loses energy. The energy the electron loses becomes light, with the frequency corresponding to a change in energy. Bohr's model depends on the connection between the frequency of light and the energy of the level change. If light of a frequency corresponding to the energy change interacts with the atom, the electron can absorb the light and jump up a level. The main problem with Bohr's model was insufficient explanation to describe atoms with more than one electron. Let us discuss more about this topic. According to Niels Bohr, an electron can circle the nucleus in orbits of only certain distances from the nucleus. Bohr called these orbits or energy levels. An electron cannot be in between energy levels. For example, it is either on the first level or the second. Therefore, energy is quantized. Niels Bohr realized that the spectra were being created as electrons move between these energy levels. If an electron absorbs energy, it may jump to a higher energy level. When an electron is at higher energy level, we say that the electron is in its excited state. When the electron releases energy in the form of radiation, we say that the electron has returned to its ground state. The type of radiation that is emitted depends on the amount of energy released. So this is the Bohr model. This one is the nucleus. We have here the first energy level, second energy level, third energy level, and fourth energy level. When energy enters the atom, an electron shown in red can absorb the energy becoming excited and jump into a higher energy level. When the electron releases the energy, the electron returns to lower energy levels. Other forms of electromagnetic radiation besides visible light can be emitted. Now, when the electron returns to its ground state, it has the option of jumping down multiple energy levels rather than one at a time. Rutherford and Bohr's model focus on describing the path of the electron around the nucleus like a particle. Austrian physicist Arvind Schrödinger treated the electron as a wave. In addition to note that there were energy levels in the atom, three scientists began to notice other things. Three physicists led the development of a better model of an atom known as quantum mechanical model. These were Louis de Broglie, Erwin Schrödinger, and Werner Karl Heisenberg. De Broglie proposed that the electron 
which start up as a particle could also be thought up as a wave. Schrodinger used this idea to develop a mathematical equation to describe the hydrogen atom. Heisenberg discovered that for, that for a very small particle like the electron, its location cannot be exactly known and how it is moving. This is called uncertainty principle. Instead, these three scientists believe that there is only a probability that the electron can be found in a certain volume in space around the nucleus. This volume or region of space around the nucleus where the electron is most likely to be found is called an atomic orbital. Thus, we could only guess the most probable location of the electron at a certain time to be within a certain volume of space surrounding the nucleus. Schrodinger treated electrons as a waves in a model called quantum mechanical model of the atom. Schrodinger's equation applied equally well to elements other than hydrogen, unlike Bohr's model. There is a key point about the Bohr model that is no longer accepted in current models of the atom. In the Bohr model, the electrons are still thought to orbit the nucleus, just like the planet orbits the sun. The quantum mechanical model makes no attempt to predict the path of an electron around the nucleus. Bohr orbits were replaced with quantum mechanical orbitals. Louis de Broglie hypothesized that particles including electrons could also have wave-like behaviors. Electrons do not behave like particles flying through space, meaning we cannot in general describe their exact paths. Heisenberg showed it is impossible to take any measurement of an object without disturbing it. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle states that it is fundamentally impossible to know precisely both the velocity and position of a particle at the same time. Now let's have the comparison of the Bohr and Schrodinger model. In Bohr model, electron in an orbit around the nucleus. It knows distance, radius of electron with certainty, and knows energy of electron with certainty. In Schrodinger model, the wave function defines energy and position of electron. It chooses to define energy of electron precisely. The exact position is not known, and the wave function describes probability of finding the electron. Bohr's atomic model can only describe atomic spectral of an atom having only one electron like that of hydrogen. An Austrian physicist, Erwin Schrodinger, together with Werner Heisenberg and Louis de Broglie made a refinement of Bohr's atomic model. Schrodinger used mathematical equations to describe the possibility of finding an electron in a certain location. This model is known as the quantum mechanical model of the atom. In quantum mechanical model, the only quantity that can be known is the probability for an electron to occupy a certain region around the nucleus. The three physicists led the development of a better model of the atom. The quantum mechanical model shows that atom has a nucleus at the center surrounded by the moving electrons. The electrons are described as a cloud of negative charge with a geometric shape. These electrons are arranged in principal or main energy levels, also called as shells, that consist of one or more sub-levels. Electron configuration is the way which electrons are arranged in the electron shell of the atom. Electrons always fill the electron shells with lower energy first. Orbitals are different from orbits in that they represent probability maps that show a statistical distribution of where the electron is likely to be found. The quantum mechanical model of the atom comes from the mathematical solution to the Schrodinger equation. The quantum mechanical model views an electron as a cloud of negative charge ha having a certain geometrical shape. This model shows how likely an electron cloud be found in various locations around the nucleus. However, the model does not give any information about the electron moves from one position to another. The electron cloud of an atom represents the locations where an electron is likely to be found. 
the probability of finding an electron within a certain volume of space surrounding the nucleus can be represented as fuzzy cloud. The cloud is more dense where the probability of finding the electron is high. The quantum mechanical model presented by Schrodinger was based on mathematical equations and views electron as a cloud of negative charge, but it does not give any information about how electrons move outside the nucleus. Quantum mechanics is a mathematical way of describing where electrons are located. It is based on the probability of finding an electron in the space outside the nucleus. To best describe the probable location of electron in an atom is by considering the following the principal energy level, the energy sub-level, the orbital in each sub-level, and the speed. Now, why quantum numbers? The quantum numbers are like an address, state, city, street, house number. Each piece of information is needed to describe the location, and each one tells more specific information about where the electron is located. Let's have the first quantum number, the energy level. Each energy level is farther away from the nucleus. Electrons are attracted to the nucleus, so they will fill the lower energy levels first. It indicates the relative size and energy of atomic orbitals. Based on the quantum mechanical model, it would be impossible to plot a definite path or orbit for the moving electrons. At least, we can only guess the most probable location of the electron in a given instant to be within a certain volume or region of space surrounding the nucleus. Now let's have the second quantum number, the subshell. Quantum mechanics sets no limit as to how many energy levels exist, but no more than seven principal energy levels are needed to describe the electrons of all known atoms. Each energy level can have as many sub-levels as the principal quantum number. The sub-level is identified by a letter. As the energy levels increase, so do the number of subshells that are needed to cover all the space around the atom. The first, energy, the first energy level has one subshell, the second energy level has two subshells, the third energy level has three subshells, and the fourth energy level has four subshells. Beginning with the lowest energy sublevel, the sublevels are identified by the letters S, E, D, F. G, H, and I, and so on. Every energy level will have an S sub-level, but only energy level 2 and above will have B sub-levels. Similarly, B sub-levels occur in energy level 3 and above, and F sub-levels in energy level 4 and above. Energy level 5 could have a fifth sub-level named G. Energy level 6 could have a sixth sub-level named H and energy level 7 could have a 7th sub-level named I, but all the known atoms can have, can have their electrons described without ever using G, H, and I sub-levels. Therefore, it is often said that there are only 4 sub-levels, although theoretically, there can be more than 4 sub-levels. The sub-shells describe the way electron moves or the shape of the probability distribution. Orbitals have specific energy values and particular shapes and directions. The S orbitals are spherical. The P orbitals are peanut shape or dumbbell shape. The D orbitals are double peanut shape. And the F orbitals are flower shape. Now, what does SPDF mean? S means sharp, P means principal. B means diffuse and F means fundamental. To recap, energy level 1 has one subshell, which is S. Energy level 2 has two subshells, S and P. Energy level 3 has three subshells, S, P, and D. And energy level 4 has four subshells, S, P, D, and F, etc. Now, why are more subshells present? Each energy level is larger than the previous. As a result, there are more possible locations for where an electron could reside. Shells are divided into subshells designated by letters S, E, D, and F, and these subshells are grouped into orbitals. Orbital is a region of space that can hold one or maximum 
of two electrons. S subshell can hold maximum of two electrons. P subshell can hold maximum of six electrons. D subshell can hold maximum of ten electrons, and F subshell can hold maximum of fourteen electrons. Third quantum number is atomic orbitals. The atomic orbitals essentially describes how many of that shape of subshell are needed to cover all the space around the nucleus. The more complicated the shape, the more orbitals are needed to cover all the space. An orbital is the region around the nucleus where the electron is most likely to be found. The atomic orbital serves as the house of the electron. It can accommodate a maximum of two electrons. S has one orbital, E has three orbitals, D has five orbitals, and F has seven orbitals. Orbitals have specific MD values. They have particular shapes and direction in space. The S orbitals are spherical and E orbitals are dumbbell shapes, as shown in the illustration. Because of the spherical shape of an S orbital, the probability of finding an electron at a given distance from the nucleus is an S orbital does not depend on direction, unlike the three kinds of E orbitals which are oriented along the X, Y, and Z axis. So they have different orientations in space, Px, Ey, and Pz. The shapes of the other orbitals, the D and the F orbitals, were derived from complex calculation. The fourth quantum number is electron spin. Each electron can be spin up or spin down. No two electrons in the same orbital orientation can have the same spin. And with only one spin up and spin down, the maximum number of electrons that can fit into any given orbital orientation is only two. And this is what you call the Pauli exclusion principle. To gain more understanding about the lesson, let's fill in the needed information in the table. So we have here the first column, the energy level, next possible subshells, and third column, the atomic orbitals, fourth number of electrons in each subshell, and last, the maximum possible electrons in energy level. The table shows the relationship between N, the principal quantum number, the number of orbitals and the maximum number of electrons in the principal energy level. Theoretically, the number of orbitals and the number of electrons continue to increase for higher values of n. However, no atom actually has more than 32 electrons in any of its principal levels. As shown in the table, the principal quantum number is always equal to the number of sublevels within the principal energy level. That is, the principal energy level 1 will have one sublevel. Principal energy level 2 will have two sublevels. Principal energy level 3 will have three sublevels and so on. The maximum number of electrons that can occupy a principal energy level is given by the formula 2n squared, where n is the principal quantum number. So let's have an example. For energy level 1, it has one subshell which is S. For S subshell, it consists of one orbital. And remember, for orbital, it consists of two maximum number of electrons. And the total maximum possible electrons in energy level is two. For energy level two, it has two subshells, the S and P. Remember that S has one orbital and P has three orbitals. Then you get the number of electrons in each subshell. Remember that each orbital can only hold two maximum number of electrons. So for S subshell, it can hold two electrons. And for P subshell, since it has three orbitals, so P times two, and that is equal to six. Then you get the maximum possible electrons in energy level two, which is equal to eight. Or you can also use the formula two n squared to get this maximum possible electrons in energy level two. Next is energy level 3 that consists of three subshells, S, P, and D. So again, S has one orbital, P has three orbitals, and D has five orbitals. Each orbitals or subshells can only hold two maximum number of electrons. So for S subshell, it has two electrons. For P subshells, it has six electrons since it 
consists of three orbitals, and for D subshell, and for D subshells has ten electrons since it consists of five orbitals, and you get the total maximum possible electrons in energy level two, and that is two D. Or again, you can also use the formula to n squared. Lastly, is energy level four that consists of four subshells, the S, P, D, F. And the atomic orbital for S is 1, for P is 3, D is 5, and F is 7. Now the number of electrons in each subshell in the following. So we have 2 for S, 6 for P, 10 for D, and 14 for F subshells. And you get the total maximum possible electron in the level 4, and that's equal to 32. So again, you use the formula 2 and square to get this. Let's evaluate. To check your understanding, answer the following. Now that you have learned a lot from the very start of our lesson, you may now complete these statements. Choose words from the list to fill in the blanks in the paragraph. Write your answer on a sheet of paper or in a notebook. You may pause the video to answer this. Check your answers and show your score to your teacher. Number 1, the correct answer is Atom. Number 2, Dalton is the answer. 3, Thompson. Or rather, four, five, four, six, Heisenberg, seven, Schrodinger, eight, quantum mechanical. Lastly, orbital is the correct answer for number ten. So that's the end of our lesson. I hope you learned something new today. Watch out for the next video lesson in science. Answer the questions and activities in your module appropriately. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. This has been your teacher, Rosalie Custodio, saying. Learning science is fun, cool, and awesome. Until next time, students, thank you for watching and have a nice day.